Section three of Weirwolf Five Pieces by Various. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Section three The Weirwolf by Clements Houseman. Part one. The great farm hall was ablaze with the firelight and noisy with laughter and talk and many sounding work. None could be idle but the very young and the very old little rawl who was hugging a puppy and old trella whose palsied hand fumbled over her knitting the early evening had closed in and the farm servants come from their outdoor work had assembled in the ample hall which gave space for a score or more of workers several of the men were engaged in carving and to these were yielded the best place and light others made or repaired fishing tackle and harness and a great seine net occupied three pairs of hands of the women most were sorting and mixing eider feather and chopping straw to add to it looms were there although not in present use but three wheels whirred emulously and the finest and swiftest thread of the three ran between the fingers of the housemistress near her were some children busy too plaiting wicks for candles and lamps each group of workers had a lamp in its centre and those farthest from the fire had live heat from the two braziers filled with glowing wood embers replenished now and again from the generous hearth but the flicker of the great fire was manifest to remotest corners and prevailed beyond the limits of the weaker lights little rawl grew tired of his puppy dropped it incontinently and made an onslaught on tyre the old wolfhound who basked dozing whimpering and twitching in his hunting dreams prone went rawl beside tyre his young arms round the shaggy neck his curls against the black jowl tyre gave a perfunctory lick and stretched with a sleepy sigh roll growled and rolled and shoved invitingly but could only gain from the old dog placid toleration and a half observant blink take that then said rawl indignant at this ignoring of his advances and sent the puppy sprawling against the dignity that disdained him as playmate the dog took no notice and the child wandered off to find amusement elsewhere the baskets of white eider feathers caught his eye far off in a distant corner he slipped under the table and crept along on all fours the ordinary commonplace custom of walking down a room upright not being to his fancy when close to the women he lay still for a moment watching with his elbows on the floor and his chin in his palms one of the women seeing him nodded and smiled and presently he crept out behind her skirts and passed hardly noticed from one to another till he found opportunity to possess himself of a large handful of feathers with these he traversed the length of the room under the table again and emerged near the spinners at the feet of the youngest he curled himself round sheltered by her knees from the observation of the others and disarmed her of interference by secretly displaying his handful with a confiding smile a dubious nod satisfied him and presently he started on the play he had devised he took a tuft of the white down and gently shook it free of his fingers close to the whirl of the wheel the wind of the swift motion took it, spun it round and round in widening circles, till it floated above like a slow white moth. Little Roll's eyes danced, and the row of his small teeth shone in a silent laugh of delight. Another and another of the white tufts was sent whirling round like a winged thing in a spider's web, and floating clear at last. Presently the handful failed rawl sprawled forward to survey the room and contemplate another journey under the table his shoulder thrusting forward checked the wheel for an instant he shifted hastily the wheel flew on with a jerk and the thread snapped naughty rawl said the girl the swiftest wheel stopped also and the housemistress rawl's aunt 
leaned forward and sighting the low curly head gave a warning against mischief and sent him off to old trella's corner rawl obeyed and after a discreet period of obedience sidled out again down the length of the room farthest from his aunt's eye as he slipped in among the men they looked up to see that their tools might be as far as possible out of reach of rawl's hands and close to their own nevertheless before long he managed to secure a fine chisel and take off its point on the leg of the table the carver's strong objections to this disconcerted rawl who for five minutes thereafter effaced himself under the table during this seclusion he contemplated the many pairs of legs that surrounded him and almost shut out the light of the fire how very odd some of the legs were some were curved where they should be straight and some were straight where they should be curved and as rawl said to himself they all seem screwed on differently some were tucked away modestly under the benches others were thrust far out under the table encroaching on rawl's own particular domain he stretched out his own short legs and regarded them critically and after comparison favourably why were not all legs made like his or like his these legs approved by rawl were a little apart from the rest he crawled opposite and again made comparison his face grew quite solemn as he thought of the innumerable days to come before his legs could be as long and strong he hoped they would be just like those his models as straight as to bone and as curved as to muscle a few moments later swain of the long legs felt a small hand caressing his foot and looking down met the upturned eyes of his little cousin rawl lying on his back still softly patting and stroking the young man's foot the child was quiet and happy for a good while he watched the movement of the strong deft hands and the shifting of the bright tools now and then minute chips of wood puffed off by swain fell down upon his face at last he raised himself very gently lest a jog should wake impatience in the carver and crossing his own legs round swain's ankle clasping with his arms too laid his head against the knee such act is evidence of a child's most wonderful hero worship quite content was rawl and more than content when swain paused a minute to joke and pat his head and pull his curls quiet he remained as long as quiescence is possible to limbs young as his swain forgot he was near hardly noticed when his leg was gently released and never saw the stealthy abstraction of one of his tools ten minutes thereafter was a lamentable wail from low on the floor rising to the full pitch of rawl's healthy lungs for his hand was gashed across and the copious bleeding terrified him then was there soothing and comforting washing and binding and a modicum of scolding till the loud outcry sank into occasional sobs and the child tear-stained and subdued was returned to the chimney quarter settle where trella nodded in the reaction after pain and fright roll found that the quiet of that firelit corner was to his mind tire too disdained him no longer but roused by his sobs showed all the concern and sympathy that a dog can by licking and wistful watching a little shame weighed also upon his spirits he wished he had not cried quite so much he remembered how once swain had come home with his arm torn down from the shoulder and a dead bear and how he had never winced nor said a word though his lips turned white with pain poor little rawl gave another sighing sob over his own faint-hearted shortcomings the light and motion of the great fire began to tell strange stories to the child and the wind in the chimney roared a corroborative note now and then 
the great black mouth of the chimney impending high over the hearth received as into a mysterious gulf murky coils of smoke and brightness of aspiring sparks and beyond in the high darkness were muttering and wailing and strange doings so that sometimes the smoke rushed back in panic and curled out and up to the roof and condensed itself to invisibility among the rafters. And then the wind would rage after its lost prey, and rush round the house, rattling and shrieking at window and door. In a lull, after one such loud gust, Roll lifted his head in surprise and listened. A lull had also come on the babble of talk, and thus could be heard with strange distinctness a sound outside the door the sound of a child's voice, a child's hands. "'Open, open, let me in,' piped the little voice from low down, lower than the handle, and the latch rattled as though a tiptoe child reached up to it, and soft small knocks were struck. One near the door sprang up and opened it. "'No one is here,' he said. Tyre lifted his head and gave utterance to a howl, loud, prolonged, most dismal. Swain, not able to believe that his ears had deceived him, got up and went to the door. It was a dark night, the clouds were heavy with snow that had fallen fitfully when the wind lulled. Untrodden snow lay up to the porch. There was no sight nor sound of any human being. Swain strained his eyes far and near, only to see dark sky, pure snow, and a line of black fir-trees on a hill-brow, bowing down before the wind. "'Oh, it must have been the wind,' he said, and closed the door. Many faces looked scared. The sound of a child's voice had been so distinct, and the words, "'Open, open, let me in!' The wind might creak the wood or rattle the latch, but could not speak with a child's voice, nor knock with the soft, plain blows that a plump fist gives. And the strange, unusual howl of the wolfhound was an omen to be feared, be the rest what it might. Strange things were said by one and another, till the rebuke of the housemistress quelled them into far-off whispers for a time after there was uneasiness constraint and silence then the chill fear thawed by degrees and the babble of talk flowed on again yet half an hour later a very slight noise outside the door sufficed to arrest every hand every tongue every head was raised and every eye fixed in one direction it is christian he is late said swain no no this is a feeble shuffle not a young man's tread. With the sound of uncertain feet came the hard tap-tap of a stick against the door, and the high-pitched voice of Eld, "'Open, open, let me in!' Again Tyre flung up his head in a long, doleful howl. Before the echo of the tapping stick and the high voice had fairly died away, Swain had sprung across to the door and flung it wide. "'No one again,' he said in a steady voice, though his eyes looked startled as he stared out. He saw the lonely expanse of snow, the clouds swagging low, and between the two the line of dark fir-trees bowing in the wind. He closed the door without a word of comment, and recrossed the room. A score of blanched faces were turned to him as though he must be solver of the enigma. He could not be unconscious of this mute eye-questioning, and it disturbed his resolute air of composure. He hesitated, glanced toward his mother, the housemistress, then back at the frightened folk, and gravely, before them all, made the sign of the cross. There was a flutter of hands as the sign was repeated by all, and the dead silence was stirred as by a huge sigh, for the held breath of many was freed as though the sign gave magic relief. Even the housemistress was perturbed. She left her wheel and crossed the room to her son, and spoke with him for a moment in a low tone that none could overhear. 
but a moment later her voice was high-pitched and loud so that all might benefit by her rebuke of the heathen chatter of one of the girls perhaps she essayed to silence thus her own misgivings and forebodings no other voice dared speak now with its natural fullness low tones made intermittent murmurs and now and then silence drifted over the whole room the handling of tools was as noiseless as might be and suspended on the instant if the door rattled in a gust of wind after a time swain left his work joined the group nearest the door and loitered there on the pretense of giving advice and help to the unskilful a man's tread was heard outside in the porch christian said swain and his mother simultaneously he confidently she authoritatively to set the checked wheels going again but tyre flung up his head with an appalling howl open open let me in it was a man's voice and the door shook and rattled as a man's strength beat against it swain could feel the planks quivering as on the instant his hand was upon the door flinging it open to face the blank porch and beyond only snow and sky and firs aslant in the wind he stood for a long minute with the open door in his hand the bitter wind swept in with its icy chill but a deadlier chill of fear came swifter and seemed to freeze the beating of hearts swain stepped back to snatch up a great bearskin cloak swain where are you going no farther than the porch mother and he stepped out and closed the door he wrapped himself in the heavy fur and leaning against the most sheltered wall of the porch steeled his nerves to face the devil and all his works no sound of voices came from within the most distinct sound was the crackle and roar of the fire it was bitterly cold his feet grew numb but he forbore stamping them into warmth lest the sound should strike panic within nor would he leave the porch nor print a footmark on the untrodden white that declared so absolutely how no human voices and hands could have approached the door since snow fell two hours or more ago when the wind drops there will be more snow thought swain for the best part of an hour he kept his watch and saw no living thing heard no unwanted sound i will freeze here no longer he muttered and re-entered one woman gave a half-suppressed scream as his hand was laid on the latch and then a gasp of relief as he came in no one questioned him only his mother said in a tone of forced unconcern could you not see christian coming as though she were made anxious only by the absence of her younger son hardly had swain stamped near to the fire than clear knocking was heard at the door tyre leapt from the hearth his eyes red as the fire his fangs showing white in the black jowl his neck ridged and bristling and overleaping rawl ramped at the door barking furiously outside the door a clear mellow voice was calling tyre's bark made the words undistinguishable no one offered to stir towards the door before swain he stalked down the room resolutely lifted the latch and swung back the door a white-robed woman glided in no wraith living beautiful young tyre leapt upon her lithely she balked the sharp fangs with folds of her long fur robe and snatching from her girdle a small two-edged axe whirled it up for a blow of defence swain caught the dog by the collar and dragged him off yelling and struggling the stranger stood in the doorway motionless one foot set forward one arm flung up till the housemistress hurried down the room and swain relinquishing to others the furious tire turned again to close the door and offer excuse for so fierce a greeting then she lowered her arm slung the axe in its place at her waist loosened the furs about her face and shook over her shoulders the long white robe all as it were with the sway of one movement she was a maiden tall and very fair 
the fashion of her dress was strange half masculine yet not unwomanly a fine fur tunic reaching but little below the knee was all the skirt she wore below were the cross-bound shoes and leggings that a hunter wears a white fur cap was set low upon the brows and from its edge strips of fur fell lappet-wise about her shoulders two of these at her entrance had been drawn forward and crossed about her throat but now loosened and thrust back left unhidden long plaits of fair hair that lay forward on shoulder and breast down to the ivory-studded girdle where the axe gleamed swain and his mother led the stranger to the hearth without question or sign of curiosity till she voluntarily told her tale of a long journey to distant kindred a promised guide unmet and signals and landmarks mistaken alone exclaimed swain in astonishment have you journeyed thus far a hundred leagues alone she answered yes with a little smile over the hills and the wastes why the folk there are savage and wild as beasts she dropped her hand upon her axe with a laugh of some scorn i fear neither man nor beast some few fear me and then she told strange tales of fierce attack and defence and of the bold free huntress life she had led her words came a little slowly and deliberately as though she spoke in a scarce familiar tongue now and then she hesitated and stopped in a phrase as though for lack of some word she became the centre of a group of listeners the interest she excited dissipated in some degree the dread inspired by the mysterious voices there was nothing ominous about this young bright fair reality though her aspect was strange little rawl crept near staring at the stranger with all his might unnoticed he softly stroked and patted a corner of her soft white robe that reached to the floor in ample folds he laid his cheek against it caressingly and then edged up close to her knees what is your name he asked the stranger's smile and ready answer as she looked down saved Roll from the rebuke merited by his unmannerly question my real name she said would be uncouth to your ears and tongue the folk of this country have given me another name and from this she laid her hand on the fur robe they call me white fell little Roll repeated it to himself stroking and patting as before white fell white fell the fair face and soft beautiful dress pleased rawl he knelt up with his eyes on her face and an air of uncertain determination like a robin's on a doorstep and plumped his elbows into her lap with a little gasp at his own audacity rawl exclaimed his aunt but oh let him said white fell smiling and stroking his head and rawl stayed he advanced farther, and, panting at his own adventurousness in the face of his aunt's authority, climbed up to her knees. Her welcoming arms hindered any protest. He nestled happily, fingering the axe-head, the ivory studs in her girdle, the ivory clasp at her throat, the plaits of fair hair. Rubbing his head against the softness of her fur-clad shoulder, with a child's full confidence in the kindness of beauty white fell had not uncovered her head only knotted the pendant fur loosely behind her neck rawl reached up his hand towards it whispering her name to himself white fell white fell then slid his arms round her neck and kissed her once twice she laughed delightedly and kissed him again the child plagued you said swain Oh no indeed she answered with an earnestness so intense as to seem disproportionate to the occasion rawl settled himself again on her lap and began to unwind the bandage bound round his hand he paused a little when he saw where the blood had soaked through then went on till his hand was bare and the cut displayed gaping and long though only skin deep 
he held it up towards Whitefell, desirous of her pity and sympathy. At sight of it and the blood-stained linen, she drew in her breath suddenly, clasped Rawl to her, hard, hard, till he began to struggle. Her face was hidden behind the boy, so that none could see its expression. It had lighted up with a most awful glee. Afar, beyond the fir grove, beyond the low hill behind, the absent Christian was hastening his return. From daybreak he had been afoot, carrying notice of a bear hunt to all the best hunters of the farms and hamlets that lay within a radius of twelve miles. Nevertheless, having been detained till a late hour, he now broke into a run, going with a long, smooth stride of apparent ease that fast made the miles diminish. He entered the midnight blackness of the fir grove with scarcely slackened pace, though the path was invisible, and passing through into the open again, sighted the farm lying a furlong off down the slope. Then he sprang out freely, and almost on the instant gave one great sideways leap and stood still. There in the snow was the track of a great wolf. His hand went to his knife, his only weapon. He stooped, knelt down, to bring his eyes to the level of a beast, and peered about. His teeth set, his heart beat a little harder than the pace of his running insisted on. A solitary wolf, nearly always savage and of large size, is a formidable beast that will not hesitate to attack a single man. This wolf-track was the largest Christian had ever seen, and, so far as he could judge, recently made. It led from under the fir trees down the slope. Well for him, he thought, was the delay that had so vexed him before. Well for him that he had not passed through the dark fir grove when that danger of jaws lurked there. Going warily, he followed the track. It led down the slope, across a broad ice-bound stream, along the level beyond, making towards the farm. A less precise knowledge had doubted and guessed that here might have come straying Big Tyre or his like. But Christian was sure, knowing better than to mistake between footmark of dog and wolf. Straight on, straight on, towards the farm. Surprised and anxious grew Christian that a prowling wolf would dare so near. He drew his knife and pressed on, more hastily, more keen-eyed. Oh, that Tyre were with him! straight on straight on even to the very door where the snow failed his heart seemed to give a great leap and then stop there the track ended nothing lurked in the porch and there was no sign of return the firs stood straight against the sky the clouds lay low for the wind had fallen and a few snowflakes came drifting down in a horror of surprise, Christian stood dazed a moment, then he lifted the latch and went in. His glance took in all the old familiar forms and faces, and with them that of the stranger, fur-clad and beautiful. The awful truth flashed upon him. He knew what she was. Only a few were startled by the rattle of the latch as he entered. The room was filled with bustle and movement, for it was the supper hour, when all tools were laid aside and trestles and tables shifted. Christian had no knowledge of what he said and did. He moved and spoke mechanically, half thinking that soon he must wake from this horrible dream. Swain and his mother supposed him to be cold and dead tired, and spared all unnecessary questions and he found himself seated beside the hearth opposite that dreadful thing that looked like a beautiful girl, watching her every movement, curdling with horror to see her fondle the child raw. Swain stood near them both, intent upon white fell also, but how differently! She seemed unconscious of the gaze of both, neither aware of the chill dread in the eyes of Christian, nor of Swain's warm admiration. 
These two brothers, who were twins, contrasted greatly, despite their striking likeness. They were alike in regular profile, fair brown hair, and deep blue eyes, but Swain's features were perfect as a young god's, while Christian's showed faulty details. Thus the line of his mouth was set too straight, the eyes shelved too deeply back, and the contour of the face flowed in less generous curves than Swain's. Their height was the same, but Christian was too slender for perfect proportion, while Swain's well-knit frame, broad shoulders, and muscular arms made him preeminent for manly beauty as well as for strength. As a hunter, Swain was without rival, as a fisher, without rival. All the countryside acknowledged him to be the best wrestler, rider, dancer, singer. Only in speed could he be surpassed, and in that only by his younger brother. All others Swain could distance fairly, but Christian could outrun him easily. Ay, he could keep pace with Swain's most breathless burst, and laugh and talk the while. Christian took little pride in this fleetness of foot, counting a man's legs to be the least worthy of his members. He had no envy of his brother's athletic superiority, though to several feats he had made a moderate second. He loved as only a twin can love, proud of all that Swain did, content with all that Swain was, humbly content also that his own great love should not be so exceedingly returned, since he knew himself to be so far less love-worthy. Christian dared not, in the midst of women and children, launch the horror that he knew into words. He waited to consult his brother, but Swain did not, or would not, notice the signal he made, and kept his face always turned towards White Fell. Christian drew away from the hearth, unable to remain passive with that dread upon him. "'Where is Tyre?' he said suddenly. Then, catching sight of the dog in a distant corner, "'Why is he chained there?' "'He flew at the stranger,' one answered. Christian's eyes glowed. "'Yes?' he said interrogatively. He was within an ace of having his brain knocked out. "'Tire?' "'Yes, she was nimbly up with that little axe she has at her waist. It was well for old Tire that his master throttled him off.' Christian went without a word to the corner where Tyre was chained. The dog rose up to meet him, as piteous and indignant as a dumb beast can be. He stroked the black head. Good Tyre, brave dog! They knew, they only, and the man and the dumb dog had comfort of each other. Christian's eyes turned again towards Whitefell tires also, and he strained against the length of the chain. Christian's hand lay on the dog's neck, and he felt it ridge and bristle with the quivering of impotent fury. Then he began to quiver in like manner with a fury born of reason, not instinct, as impotent morally as was tire physically. Oh, the woman's form that he dare not touch! Anything but that! and he with Tyre would be free to kill or be killed. Then he turned to ask fresh questions. How long has the stranger been here? Oh, she came about half hour before you. Who opened the door to her? Swain. No one else dared. The tone of the answer was mysterious. Why, queried Christian, has anything strange happened? Tell me. For answer he was told, in a low undertone, of the summons at the door, thrice repeated, without human agency, and of Tyre's ominous howls, and of Swain's fruitless watch outside. Christian turned towards his brother in a torment of impatience for a word apart. The board was spread, and Swain was leading Whitefell to the guest's place. This was more awful. She would break bread with them under the roof-tree. He started forward and touched Swain's arm, whispered an urgent entreaty. Swain stared and shook his head in angry impatience. 
Thereupon Christian would take no morsel of food. His opportunity came at last. Whitefell questioned of the landmarks of the country, and of one Cairn Hill, which was an appointed meeting-place, at which she was due that night. The housemistress and Swain both exclaimed, "'It is three long miles away,' said Swain, "'with no place for shelter but a wretched hut. Stay with us this night, and I will show you the way to-morrow.' Whitefell seemed to hesitate. Three miles, she said. Then I should be able to see or hear a signal. I will look out, said Swain. Then, if there be no signal, you must not leave us. He went to the door. Christian rose silently and followed him out. Swain, do you know what she is? Swain, surprised at the vehement grasp and low, hoarse voice, made answer, She? Who? Whitefell? Yes. She is the most beautiful girl I have ever seen. She is a werewolf. Swain burst out laughing. Are you mad? he asked. No. Here. See for yourself. Christian drew him out of the porch, pointing to the snow where the footmarks had been. Had been, for now they were not. Snow was falling fast, and every dent was blotted out. Well, asked Swain, had you come when I signed to you, you would have seen for yourself. Seen what? The footprints of a wolf leading up to the door, none leading away. It was impossible not to be startled by the tone alone, though it was hardly above a whisper. Swain eyed his brother anxiously, but in the darkness could make nothing of his face. Then he laid his hands kindly and reassuringly on Christian's shoulders, and felt how he was quivering with excitement and horror. One sees strange things, he said, when the cold has got into the brain behind the eyes. You came in cold and worn out. No, interrupted Christian. I saw the track first on the brow of the slope, and followed it down right here to the door. This is no delusion. Swain, in his heart, felt positive that it was. Christian was given to daydreams and strange fancies, though never had he been possessed with so mad a notion before. Don't you believe me? said Christian desperately. You must. I swear it is sane truth. Are you blind? Why, even Tyre knows. You will be clearer headed to morrow, after a night's rest. Then come, too, if you will, with Whitefell to the hill cairn, and if you have doubts still, watch and follow, and see what footprints she leaves. Galled by Swain's evident contempt, Christian turned abruptly to the door. Swain caught him back. What now, Christian, what are you going to do? You do not believe me. My mother shall. Swain's grasp tightened. You shall not tell her, he said authoritatively. Customarily, Christian was so docile to his brother's mastery that it was now a surprising thing when he wrenched himself free vigorously and said as determinedly as Swain, she shall know. But Swain was nearer the door and would not let him pass. There has been scare enough for one night already. If this notion of yours will keep, broach it to-morrow. Christian would not yield. Women are so easily scared, pursued Swain, and are ready to believe any folly without shadow of proof. Be a man, Christian, and fight this notion of a werewolf by yourself. If you would believe me, began Christian. I believe you to be a fool, said Swain, losing patience. Another, who was not your brother, might believe you to be a knave, and guess that you had transformed Whitefell into a werewolf because she smiled more readily on me than on you. The jest was not without foundation, for the grace of Whitefell's bright looks had been bestowed on him, on Christian never a whit. Swain's coxcombery was always frank and most forgivable, and not without fair color. If you want an ally, continued Swain, confide in old Trella. 
out of her stores of wisdom if her memory holds good she can instruct you in the orthodox manner of tackling a werewolf if i remember aright you should watch the suspected person till midnight when the beast's form must be resumed and retained ever after if a human eye sees the change or better still sprinkle hands and feet with holy water which is certain death oh never fear but old trella will be equal to the occasion swain's contempt was no longer good-humoured some touch of irritation or resentment rose at this monstrous doubt of whitefell but christian was too deeply distressed to take offence you speak of them as old wives tales but if you had seen the proof i have seen you would be ready at least to wish them true if not also to put them to the test well said swain with a laugh that had a little sneer in it put them to the test i will not object to that if you will only keep your notions to yourself now christian give me your word for silence and we will freeze here no longer christian remained silent swain put his hands on his shoulders again and vainly tried to see his face in the darkness we have never quarrelled yet christian i have never quarrelled returned the other aware for the first time that his dictatorial brother had sometimes offered occasion for quarrel had he been ready to take it well said swain emphatically if you speak against whitefell to any other as to-night you have spoken to me we shall he delivered the words like an ultimatum turned sharp round and re-entered the house christian more fearful and wretched than before followed snow is falling fast not a single light is to be seen whitefell's eyes passed over christian without apparent notice and turned bright and shining upon swain nor any signal to be heard she queried did you not hear the sound of a sea-horn i saw nothing and heard nothing and signal or no signal the heavy snow would keep you here perforce she smiled her thanks beautifully and christian's heart sank like lead with a deadly foreboding as he noted what a light was kindled in swain's eyes by her smile that night when all others slept christian the weariest of all watched outside the guest chamber till midnight was past no sound not the faintest could be heard could the old tale be true of the midnight change what was on the other side of the door a woman or a beast he would have given his right hand to know instinctively he laid his hand on the latch and drew it softly though believing that bolts fastened the inner side the door yielded to his hand he stood on the threshold a keen gust of air cut at him the window stood open the room was empty so christian could sleep with a somewhat lightened heart in the morning there was surprise and conjecture when whitefell's absence was discovered christian held his peace not even to his brother did he say how he knew that she had fled before midnight and swain though evidently greatly chagrined seemed to disdain reference to the subject of christian's fears the elder brother alone joined the bear hunt christian found pretext to stay behind swain being out of humour manifested his contempt by uttering not a single expostulation all that day and for many a day after christian would never go out of sight of his home swain alone noticed how he manoeuvred for this and was clearly annoyed by it whitefell's name was never mentioned between them though not seldom was it heard in general talk hardly a day passed but little rawl asked when whitefell would come again pretty whitefell who kissed like a snowflake and if swain answered christian would be quite sure that the light in his eyes kindled by whitefell's smile had not yet died out little rawl naughty merry fair-haired little rawl a day came when his feet raced over the threshold never to return when his chatter and laugh were heard no more 
when tears of anguish were wept by eyes that never would see his bright head again, never again, living or dead. He was seen at dusk for the last time escaping from the house with his puppy in freakish rebellion against old Trella. Later, when his absence had begun to cause anxiety, his puppy crept back to the farm, cowed, whimpering, and yelping, a pitiful, dumb lump of terror, without intelligence or courage to guide the frightened search. Rawl was never found, nor any trace of him. Where he had perished was never known. How he had perished was known only by an awful guess. A wild beast had devoured him. Christian heard the conjecture, a wolf, and a horrible certainty flashed upon him that he knew what wolf it was. He tried to declare what he knew, but Swain saw him start at the words with white face and struggling lips, and guessing his purpose, pulled him back and kept him silent, hardly by his imperious grip and wrathful eyes, and one low whisper. That Christian should retain his most irrational suspicion against beautiful Whitefell was, to Swain, evidence of a weak obstinacy of mind that would but thrive upon expostulation and argument. But this evident intention to direct the passions of grief and anguish to a hatred and fear of the fair stranger such as his own was intolerable, and Swain set his will against it. Again Christian yielded to his brother's stronger words and will, and against his own judgment consented to silence. Repentance came before the new moon, the first of the year, was old. Whitefell came again, smiling as she entered, as though assured of a glad and kindly welcome. And in truth there was only one who saw again her fair face and strange white garb without pleasure. Swain's face glowed with delight, while Christian's grew pale and rigid as death. He had given his word to keep silence, but he had not thought that she would dare to come again. Silence was impossible face to face with that thing, impossible. Irrepressibly he cried out, Where is Rawl? Not a quiver disturbed Whitefell's face. She heard, yet remained bright and tranquil. Swain's eyes flashed round at his brother dangerously. Among the women some tears fell at the poor child's name, but none caught alarm from its sudden utterance, for the thought of Rawl rose naturally. Where was little Rawl, who had nestled in the stranger's arms, kissing her, and watched for her since, and prattled of her daily? Christian went out silently. One only thing there was that he could do, and he must not delay. His horror overmastered any curiosity to hear Whitefell's smooth excuses and smiling apologies for her strange and uncourteous departure, or her easy tale of the circumstances of her return, or to watch her bearing as she heard the sad tale of little Rawl. The swiftest runner of the countryside had started on his hardest race little less than three leagues and back, which he reckoned to accomplish in two hours, though the night was moonless and the way rugged. He rushed against the still cold air till it felt like a wind upon his face. The dim homestead sank below the ridges at his back, and fresh ridges of snowlands rose out of the obscure horizon level to drive past him as the stirless air drove, and sink away behind into obscure level again. He took no conscious heed of landmarks, not even when all sign of a path was gone under depths of snow. His will was set to reach his goal with unexampled speed, and thither by instinct his physical forces bore him, without one definite thought to guide. And the idle brain lay passive, inert, receiving into its vacancy restless siftings of past sights and sounds, rawl, weeping, laughing, playing, coiled in the arms of that dreadful thing. Tire, oh, tire, 
white fangs in the black jowl the women who wept on the foolish puppy precious for the child's last touch footprints from pine wood to door the smiling face among furs of such womanly beauty smiling smiling and swain's face swain swain oh swain my brother swain's angry laugh possessed his ear within the sound of the wind of his speed swain's scorn assailed more quick and keen than the biting cold at his throat and yet he was unimpressed by any thought of how Swain's anger and scorn would rise if this errand were known. End of section three.